Um, I don't know about you, but I find, I have found this week in, a, in prior link conferences to be really um, compelling because it brings together people on one hand that have shared interests in education and on the other hand, people who are coming from such diverse backgrounds and such diverse uh, environments. Uh, the conference this year, I think, made that clear, both of those things clear, both what we share and the differences. Um, and I, I think the things that we, sh we share, I mean, one of the key things I know we share an interest in is creating learning environments that are going to enable students of all backgrounds uh, to succeed. And as Dick Larson said on Monday, I think maybe he, I don't know if you had it up on a slide or not, Dick, is there anything more important to invest in than the education of our youth? And I think that's why we all do what we do, and that's why we're all here. And with that, let me just say that we're going to now welcome uh, the voices of some of these students who are, after all, the target of all the work that we're doing. Um, certainly, MIT's recipe for success, we have very smart faculty, we have wonderful facilities, but I believe that our recipe for success lies on a key ingredient, and that is finding the best motivated, most motivated, in, you know, creative, inspired students, whatever background they come out of, whatever, you know, their conditions they come out of, and bringing them here to MIT and giving them the opportunity to achieve what they want to achieve. I mean, most students who come here to MIT come with some sense of wanting to change the world. Uh, they've proven themselves in, in many ways as capable students uh, and motivated and passionate um, people in the world. Our role as an educational institution then is to make good use of the precious time that they spend with us here. Most of that is, most of the time it's four years, sometimes less, sometimes more. Uh, to make good use of the time we have these gifted students on campus to prepare them to lead lives where they can use their passion, use their skills, go out and address the great challenges we have in the world, transform the world. As you've heard over and over again from our faculty and from President Reif, we aspire, we don't always achieve, but we aspire here at MIT to provide an educational experience for students, which doesn't just involve giving them access to the latest science and engineering knowledge, although that's part of it, but also give them opportunities uh, to learn that involve problem solving, critical thinking, collaboration, uh, hands, lots of hands-on, you've heard that again and again, projects, leadership development offer, opportunities, designing and making things, insight into how experts in their field think, uh, and last but not least, opportunities to explore how to serve society. Um, as Sanjay said yesterday, and as Raphael uh, said again today, one of our challenges as we introduce digital learning into this mix we're trying to find a sweet spot for how digital technologies can really make all of this even better, right? How to add to the magic here. You know, we're looking for ways that digital learning will do things we can't do in the classroom, uh, or things that allow faculty and students to have more time together to do high impact things uh, in either classrooms or laboratories, things that can't be done as well online. With that as a preamble, I want to introduce you to four of our extraordinary MIT students, some uh, recent graduates, some about to graduate, some just starting. Uh, we've invited them here this morning to share their stories with you about the role that digital technology, digital learning has played in their lives some here at MIT, outside of MIT, before MIT. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing what they have to say. Um, and I'm going to introduce them. If you guys could all come and sort of sit in the front um, and do some introductions. So we didn't, we didn't get together to talk about the order people were going to talk in. I think I'm going to sort of, I'm going to start with um, Cody, because he's, he's the oldest. So he's the most senior man, man, uh, person on the panel. Um, but let me do quick, just a quick thumbnail so you get people's names in your head first. Uh, this is Anna, Anna Leonard, uh, who has recently finished up 
her studies in mechanical engineering, right? Uh, going to be graduating uh, next month, and she can tell you a little bit more when, when she talks. Next is, uh, is Rachel Reed. Rachel and Anna are in the same program, and they're, they're the same year. So again, Rachel has just finished up her studies in mechanical engineering. John. John's the one who showed up. I won't, I won't ask him where he was, but he ca caused a little heart attack to me. Uh, he didn't show up earlier this morning. But John is here, and it, let me try your name. John Purifoy? Is that, is that, how, is that how it's... Interestingly enough, pretty much everyone pronounces it correctly. It's, really, it's impressively phonetic. It doesn't seem that way. It's a, it's a it's name I haven't seen before. Uh, John uh, has just finished up his sophomore year. Is that right? He, you're majoring in computer science and physics? Exactly. Okay. Great, so we have a little bit of diversity there. And then Cody here in the middle, or on the side, um, Cody actually graduated from MIT a year ago. We brought him back for this occasion. Uh, he has a degree in electrical engineering, mm -hmm. I think both a, a CS degree and a master's of engineering, or what is it, what's the? So I did my bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering and computer science. Okay, so he is really, really smart. Uh, <laughs> But he, he's, he did some interesting things when he was here with the Office of Digital Learning, which I, I hope he'll talk about. Uh, I think you were also involved in OCW project early mm -hmm. on, right? Yeah. Um, years ago, the, with the MISTI group, yeah. right? Mis working uh, on, MISTI Mexico. MISTI Mexico, working on some metadata searching tools for mm -hmm. OCW content in Mexico. So these are our panelists. I'm going to ask Cody to start off. I don't think we have any slides, do we, right? These are just going to be informal talks. Uh, and maybe after, everyone's going to talk for about 10 minutes, because we know from Sanjay that that's the point in time where it's, you might as well just stop talking anyway. Uh, so people are going to talk for 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, depending on how fast they talk. Uh, and if there's any question at that point, we could take maybe one or two. But I want to move through and then leave some time at the end, after you've heard everybody, uh, for you to ask questions of this great group. So let's get started with Cody. Okay. And you can stand up or you can sit. Uh, what would you prefer to do? I'll stand up. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> so in order to understand how digital learning fits into my life, I think you need to understand my background and where I came from. So growing up, I had pretty humble beginnings. I was actually, never met my father. He left before I was born. And my mom was actually in prison on federal hold um, when I was born and just taken to a hospital to give um, birth to me. And then I was put into foster care and then later adopted by my biological grandmother. However, when living with my grandmother, uh, by that point in her life, she didn't really have much. She was already uh, 70 years old, taking care of me and my two brothers. Um, and really didn't have enough to get, uh, to get by. She only had social security. And later, my mom, uh, she was diagnosed with, she was diagnosed um, to be insane by the FBI while she was in prison, but later dismissed because of lack of evidence on the charges that she had, and she came to live with us. So this just created kind of a constant source of chaos in my house, where my grandmother and my mom were constantly battling over everything that you can imagine, um, and really, neither of them had time to focus on any of us. So growing up, we were, we were extremely poor. We were probably one of the poorest fa uh, families in the neighborhood. I remember in high school, they did a school drive, and they had to deliver food to us. They dropped off a box of food for us. Um, we also, because of all the fights that were happening in my house, there was a constant source of chaos and battles. By the time that we ended up having to sell the house, because my grandmother got diagnosed with dementia, we had over 75 police reports for our house, and we were the only family that had ever lived there. And that was, we had the house as soon as I was born. So just constant source of chaos, which made it just really hard to focus and to get anything done. And growing up, there wasn't an emphasis on education. There wasn't an emphasis on being successful. Uh, my grandmother, looking at my mom, she, she just kind of couldn't handle taking care of herself, let alone everyone else. And my grandmother, by the time that I came around, she was unfortunately suffering, starting to suffer from Alzheimer's and then later dementia. So by the time that I was in my junior year of high school, uh, 
I was, I was pretty much taking care of myself as well as having to take care of my grandmother, keeping the house going, helping her figure out her bills and things like that. My mom would come and go, just leaving me alone, being the youngest kid to take care of everyone. Um, however, I wanted more for my life. I wanted, I wanted to, uh, to be successful, to live a different life, to be able to actually do the things that I wanted, to explore the world, and not just be trapped in South Jersey. So I was motivated. I worked hard, and I decided to, to, that the sky was the limit, and I decided to apply to MIT as well as a bunch of other schools as an undergrad, and luckily I, I got in, and that was a life-changing experience for me. But even then, it wasn't easy. When, when I got into MIT, one of my best friends told me that the only reason that I got in was, uh, was because I was black. And then a teacher, a substitute teacher at our high school, also said that no one from Winslow, which was the high school that I went to, would ever be successful. So coming to MIT, uh, I, didn't, I didn't want to let that stop me. Instead, I wanted to prove them wrong. I wanted to show and demonstrate that regardless of where you come from, you can be successful. So throughout my time at MIT, I put in as much effort as possible, and I was able to do a bunch of amazing things. I did two internships at Google, one in Mountain View, California, and then later as a product manager in Zurich, Switzerland. I did the Cambridge MIT Exchange program where I was at Cambridge University for a year. I graduated with my bachelor's of, um, in electrical engineering and computer science in four years with a 4.9 out of 5.0 GPA. I stayed on for my master's. I got a 5.0 GPA for my master's and then got accepted into Stanford, Berkeley, MIT, and UT Austin for my PhD in computer science with a, a National Science Foundation fellowship, graduate research fellowship. And kind of throughout this entire process, throughout my time at MIT and, and even to this day, there's one question that has been bothering me. And that's why. Why was I able to be successful when there were so many people, so many of my friends I saw that got trapped, that were stuck, that weren't able to like, make that leap and able to take advantage of the resources and to, to, to reach their full potential? And a lot of people have said that my story is that I'm extraordinary or exceptional or an anomaly or even just a fluke. But I refuse to believe that. I, I don't think that I'm special, and, or at least I don't want to be. I want to live in a world where regardless of where you come from, regardless of the challenges you face, you can be successful. You can reach your potential. You can go out and do amazing things. And you can overcome those challenges that, that you face. And I think there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of different aspects of what helped me become successful. One thing that I think was incredibly important was the people that I ended up meeting along the way. I didn't have a strong biological family. There's a lot of chaos, uh, chaos going on. But in one of the roughest points, my junior year at high school, when my mom had left and my grandmother was suffering from Alzheimer's and I was helping her, one of my teachers, my trigonometry teacher, Chantel Smith, she, with a careful eye, just noticed things were going wrong. She, she first saw that I had braces on my teeth that were falling apart. Literally, brackets would come off. And she asked me, what, what's, what's going on with your braces? And I told her that my family couldn't afford to take me to the orthodontist anymore. So she took me to her, child, her children's orthodontist. She then later helped me um, do my driving lessons so that I could get a job and I could work and earn some money to take care of myself. And then when I went to MIT, when my grandmother got diagnosed with dementia and Alzheimer's and we had to put her into a nursing home and sell the house, she gave me a place to stay so that I could come and visit. And what I really want to emphasize and what I think this story shows is the fact of just how powerful human beings can be and how we can make such a difference and such an impact in someone's life and bring them to a level that they couldn't have achieved by themselves. And that's what, that's what I see um, or what I want to see more of in digital learning. We've done a lot of stuff to increase access through the amazing work of MITx, edX, OCW, as far as getting content out there. And that has brought a lot of people in. But if we want to expand our population of people that we can reach, we need to, we need to leverage the scale of humanity. We need to leverage the people that we're attracting to these classes and potentially help them meet one another, help them foster these relationships so that they can achieve more and accelerate their learning. So during my master's of engineering and work that I also hope to continue during my PhD, uh, we looked at different subpopulations in these massive open online courses uh, and MOOCs. Uh, one population that was really interesting is that we looked at teachers and teachers that were enrolling in these courses and found a significant amount of both current teachers and retired teachers and even teachers of the subject that were enrolling in these courses but they were going unnoticed. 
but we could, we could leverage their potential to actually help them, to, we could leverage their expertise to do distributed instruction, to get these people involved, to help them kind of break down the content and make smaller communities. You can imagine doing location-based things in order to like create potential study groups. I also did research using machine learning to identify, automatically identify and characterize different subpopulations in these massive open online courses using a method called topic modeling. Well, in addition to identifying the different kind of behavioral trends within a course, you can use this as a recommendation system. So you can imagine recommending students that complement one another um, together to do some form of matchmaking, to enable them to work together to go further. And I think that this might not be the final solution, but I believe that we need to go down this path. We need to explore this if we are truly to get the most out of the digital learning and the resources that we have and to reach um, more people and expand the population that we've already brought in to, um, to education and to digital learning and to make the world a better place. And kind of with that, that that's my goal. That's the thing that I want to work for. And ultimately, I want to see and live in a world where, again, regardless of where you come from, you can be successful and you can make your dreams into a reality. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Cody. Uh, I think what we'll do, we'll just sort of keep, keep moving on. Um, do I have a volunteer, or should I ask one of you? Who wants to go next? Nobody, nobody. Maybe then we'll, we'll take a breather. We'll take a question, question. Any questions in the audience? Anybody who has any comment, question for, for Cody? Hey, Cody. Uh, so no, Cody's going to be the next, uh, sometime in the next 20 or 30 years, he's going to become a senator and, and the president of the United States. Yeah. Just watch. Okay. <laughs> uh, a few of us have mapped out his career. We sort of lived through him. But Cody, what would you change in terms of governmental policy? What, what you know, look at your schools. So you just think through your life. We have all these tools. We have digital. We have all these this residential stuff. What needs to change? If you think of Cody at 16, 17, what could have helped? It's a tough question. Put you on the spot. Yeah. Uh, I think we need to, first off, just as a societal thing, especially in like the United States, is to just put more value and respect, or give more respect to the teachers, the instructors, because they're doing such amazing work, such difficult work. And oftentimes, I feel like we don't reward, we don't reward teachers enough. We don't give them kind of uh, enough to keep going. And it's such a difficult job. And dealing with situations and dealing with students from so, so many different backgrounds, it's a time-consuming job. It's more than like your nine to five. It's going to keep extending on and on. And I feel like we don't reward our instructors enough, especially um, kind of in really difficult uh, areas and through the public school system. So I probably try to put more funding aside and kind of more, um, yeah, more funding aside, provide more instruction and support for the teachers kind of throughout the country and public education. And you guys ready yet? <laughs> now, let me just say, Cody's extraordinary, but but all of these folks are extraordinary. I've read your biographies. I know what you guys have done. So I look forward to hearing about it. And by the way, Anne is also, you're a swimmer, aren't you? I am. Yeah. I've been, I've been stalking. stalking. <laughs> I wanted to know my panelists since I hadn't met you yet. You got me. Um, so I'm Anna Leonard. Uh, I'm a senior, as she's mentioned. And I'm from Springfield, Missouri. Um, I'm actually from Rogersville, Missouri, which is a tiny town outside of a tiny town. Um, <clears throat> and where I grew up, it was a really strong community. People cared about each other a lot. But education was not, um, on the whole, a priority. And I was really, really lucky that for my family it was. Um, my mom taught at my high school, and so I got to hear from her perspective some of these things that 
um, some of the ways the education system kind of doesn't work. Um, but I was really lucky that within my own family, education was a huge priority. And I feel like that's how I was able to come to MIT, um, was through my family really believing in me um, and giving me those tools uh, to be able to get here. So when I got here, what I really wanted, you know, my senior year of high school, I signed up for five AP courses, if you guys know what those are, and four of them were cut. Um, and my mom was in the office and overheard the conversation about why they decided to offer PE classes instead of those AP courses. Um, and so <clears throat> that's kind of where I came from, and I found that really frustrating. And so I, what I wanted out of MIT was a place where I could be challenged, where, you know, it wasn't going to be the hardest thing that I could do was still kind of easy. Um, and that's definitely what I found. Uh, so I studied mechanical engineering, and <clears throat> I think that why I care about education is because I've experienced firsthand the trajectory change in life um, that a good education can get you. So I have two kind of experiences with digital education, one from a student, student side um, being here at MIT, and then the other, um, I tutor students from my high school. So, you know, as I've seen, I don't think the value of a good education can be overstated. And I saw a lot of people in my high school who weren't getting that, um, who were kind of falling behind. So in high school, I started tutoring after school, and I did Spanish and calculus and um, algebra and different science courses. And I, I really, really like doing that. I think that um, tutoring is just such a rewarding experience to see um, people. It is, it's like, it's personalized education, uh, which I think is really great. And so I've continued that in college, and I now um, tutor people from home online. Uh, and I think it's really wonderful. I use um, video chat to talk to these students. So usually this semester, my senior year was just insanely busy, so I haven't done as much this year. But um, in past years, I've <clears throat> worked with like two or three students a semester and with maybe meeting once a week or every other week online uh, using like FaceTime or Google Hangouts. Um, and I think the thing that is really fantastic about tutoring is that it is personalized, like I mentioned. So these students that, you know, you're in a lecture class of 300 students in college and you go to office hours, so maybe your professor knows who you are, but like maybe not. Um, and I think that a really important thing for um, being able to learn and reach your full potential is feeling like someone cares. Um, and so I think that's what students can get through, through tutoring. And then the other thing uh, that I think is really great about it is flexible timing. Um, so some of the students I meet with, like, really, um, they kind of want to meet and every, like, two or three weeks for, like, three hours and kind of go over all of the material, build, like, a study, um, a study guide for, like, big tests or big point assignments coming up. But other students I talk to have, like, a really different way of wanting to learn, and they prefer meeting for, like, 15 minutes, um, like, three times a week. And that's something that you can imagine, like, you couldn't really do get in your car and drive to someone's house for like 15 minutes three times a week is like a pretty big um, time investment to ask of someone, but it's able, like you're able to easily do that online. Um, and so the kind of the way I approach tutoring is really student driven. When, we, when I first start, um, meet, when I first meet with people, I ask them to come up with goals and then I ask them um, periodically how they, they feel like they're doing uh, in meeting those goals. And one of the things that I do that I think is really awesome is I text people to remind them to study. And a lot of people say that they, they like that a lot, that it feels really, you know, like it's not very often that your professor is in such a personal space as um, the same realm that you ha keep your friends in. Um, so I think that's, that's one thing I'll mention later too that I think could be incorporated um, in some online education systems. So I think the biggest takeaways that I've gotten from tutoring online um, is that students benefit from relationships. As Cody was saying, um, you know, you can read a textbook and sure the material is there, but we come to school and we come to interact with these people at MIT because, because of the relationships. And feeling like someone cares about you and is invested in your success is just, you can't overstate that. Um, 
when I talk to these students that, that I've worked with, the complaints, you know, when they're not doing very well that, or they're worried that they're not going to do very well, that's why they're getting tutoring, um, they don't complain about the material, they complain about the professor. Um, and I think that that is really telling. So another thing that I've learned is that uh, student focus and learning style changes dramatically based on deadline nearness. So during the summer, sometimes I work with people, and uh, occasionally, if I don't have the time, you know, I can, I'm going to school and stuff, I can't just be this person's end-all uh, instructor. So I will recommend, like, videos online. Um, if I like, don't have the time to explain something. And in the summer, people are willing to watch a little bit longer videos. They'll watch like half an hour, 45 minute videos. Um, and they're more willing to digest content that is potentially unrelated to the like, topic that they're really trying to pursue. Whereas during the semester, when they've got other courses and deadlines, like, uh -uh, like five, 10 minute videos, and it better say only the things that they need or they're not gonna watch it. Um, and I've experienced the same thing in my own learning. Um, and so I think that's important to keep in mind too, is that uh, content in video format, if it's used to supplement uh, in-person instruction, needs to be concise and to the point. Um, so then that's kind of a summary of my tutoring experience. But then as a student at MIT, uh, I've taken three MIT X courses and four or five that have Piazza, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but it's kind of an online uh, platform for asking questions and getting help from your peers um, in addition to the instructors, where you can just like ask questions and then students can answer other students' questions. Um, but the MITx courses that I've taken are Elements of Structures, Dynamics and Control One, and Thermodynamics. So those are pretty like foundational courses in mechanical engineering, and kind of the way that most of those incorporated MITx was there was a lecture, there was some sort of like online lecture component, and then there was for all three of those an online P set. Um, or actually, no, one of them was just incorporating it, so only two of them had an online piece set. But basically, the way that it worked, I think the three classes were very, very different. Um, and I think only one of them, I think, really truly succeeded. And I think the reason was because the instructor was just, like, fantastic. And I think that's... Um, kind of the biggest takeaway. So the way that uh, Elements of Structures was kind of run was you could... Uh, we watched... We went to lecture, everybody kind of like watched the lecture, you know, you drive the equations. And then online, there was some additional kind of like instructional material that was pretty much the same as what you would get in a regular lecture. And then there was an online piece set. Um, and I think that this worked like okay, um, but it was really frustrating to have to watch a lecture online that I felt like I could just go to class and watch and it would be I felt like I was so much more invested when I was in class watching the lectures because the professor was right there, my friend was sitting next to me, we could like, you laugh and make jokes and those kinds of moments help you to form memories um, about the material that you're learning and that was just like not happening for me when I was watching the videos online and so I kind of stopped watching them online and I'm not a bad student, I'm, I wanna learn but it was just not working for me. Um, Contrast that to, I took 203, which is dynamics and controls, and the online lectures were meant to be sort of um, a supplement. They weren't where you were supposed to get the bulk of your knowledge for the course from. Um, so the way that Sanjay Mahajan taught that course, and the way that he kind of did it was in the time that we were in class, he asked us questions, and I don't know if any of you are professors, I assume a lot of you are educators, but you ask a question to a class of 100 people and nobody raises their hand, and you're like, what is going on? You must know the answer, and we do. Um, but when we don't, it's really scary to raise your hand in front of a group of people who you think are so much smarter than you. No matter how long you are a student here for, you still think that you're kind of stupid and that everybody else is smarter than you. And it's not true. It's not true. And he was really fantastic in this course at really pulling out of us um, these kind of tentative answers. Of He tried to give us an understanding um, intuitively of how, uh, you know, 
what kind of frame of reference should you choose if you're on a merry-go-round and you're also running around in a circle and all of these things. And he helped us um, derive the equations by our, our own intuitive understanding of the way the problem was set up um, and then used the online videos that were available through the MITx platform as kind of supplemental. Like if you missed something in class and you didn't quite get it, there was a place where you could go and make sure that you did get it. Um, but it wasn't used as like the bedrock on which the course was, was built. And I think that is really important because I think that um, that was one class where the MITx platform really did work. Um, so then a note about the online P-sets. I think that those work really well. Some of the students that I've talked to in um, just kind of like my experiences have said that they really like the instant feedback. Um, so like when you put in your answer, it kind of tells you like, oh, well, you're missing something. Did you forget to think about gravity or friction or something? And it kind of gives you, gives you a hint, at least in this one course it did. It doesn't do that in all. Um, all of the all the courses, and I know that's a really hard thing to like come up with um, or implement. But I think that was really beneficial because you could like in real time you enter your answer and it's like oh that's not quite right, and then you go back and you do it again, and you don't have to turn your P set in and wait two weeks for it to get graded, and then you get it back and you're like oh I did it wrong, but I don't really remember, and I've got other stuff going on, so I'm not even going to look at it. Um, and so ways that I think that was, that was really good, but then a downside to that was that um, you do all of this work, all of this work trying to get to the answer, and then you just throw it all away. And so if you can't get the right answer in the end, it's like, oh, well, I don't get any partial credit. Nobody even sees the work that I've put into this, and that is a little disheartening. Um, and so I think that that should be kept in mind. You know, Maybe you should be able to like, turn your piece set in at the same time. Um, if you're getting graded online as well, uh, so that you can get some of that interaction. Another note about that is that I, I've said already I'm not a bad student, but I'm not above cheating a little bit either because people pool, you get so many um, like chances to submit the right answer, and if you're like foundational course, you like feel like you don't know what's going on. You feel like everybody else is smarter than you, and so you're in this study group, and nobody has gotten the right answer, and you each have three tries. People pool the answers together, and you try not to do that, but it is a little hard when you feel like everybody else in the class is going to get the right answer, and nobody's going to see the hard work that you did because you don't get any partial credit. Um, so I think that's really, really important to keep in mind when we're structuring these courses. Um, and so then um, another big takeaway is I think what, what worked overall in these um, online, both in my tutoring experience and with MIT, is the materials that worked were supplemental, um, not required, or they weren't on what the course was built, um, or they were review materials where you know if you missed lecture or you didn't quite get it, you could go back and look again. Um, and things that didn't really work was presentation of new material. Um, just because you do so many things on your laptop. You know, you watch videos, you do all these other things, and the temptation to command T and open up Facebook is, is very high. Um, and so I think we should keep that in mind that, you know, the, the computer is its own environment. And we structure classrooms so that uh, you're not distracted and you can focus easily on the information, but that's not the way that computers are um, built for us because they have a lot of other purposes. Um, and so I think that digital tech uh, should be used to personalize the experience as much as possible. Um, so make it so that you know, if one explanation of the material didn't work, there are a lot of different explanations that the student can go and look up on their own to supplement um, the material that they've learned in the course. Another possible idea is uh, using the like texting and email like I do. I know that's maybe a big um, ask of professors, but I feel like that's a way that at the university level a professor can make their student feel like they're getting a connection. Um, and then finally, one suggestion that I do have is that students create the content for some of these platforms. So I think a lot of you probably know that if you teach something, you're much more likely to remember it or understand that material. And an idea that I think 
would be interesting to explore is whether uh, students as an assignment could make a five minute video about a certain topic or their understanding of something. That would both help them solidify their understanding of the information and then be available as you know, a wide ar array, array of videos that students in taking the course in future years could use um, to kind of get different perspectives on the same same topic. So those are kind of uh, my feelings. I don't know if I've run a little bit long, but I feel strongly about this. So um, thanks for having me. I, I, have, a, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Anna. I, I sit on a committee here at MIT. It's a faculty committee that reviews proposals for new courses and yeah. things of that sort. And one of the things that always comes up when we introduce the idea of digital is, but what's the role, you know, if we have all this digital stuff available, what's the optimal f mix of faculty-student interaction? What happens to that? You know, yeah. what, what has your experience been, those three courses that you took that had a lot of online components? What, I mean, how did the interaction with faculty change? I feel like there was um, kind of when you asked questions or emailed your professor kind of like confused or maybe you couldn't make it to office hours and you wanted to go outside, there was a more of a willingness to kind of just send you to the course materials um, that were available online, which hopefully you've already looked at those and that's yeah. why you're kind of asking for more. Um, I don't think it changed really the interaction between the students and the instructor like in the class like during the lecture time because there was still the same amount of lecture time. Um, yeah, I don't know if that really okay. answers so, your question. So in all these cases they were still doing lecture, I mean, yeah. it, it wasn't like a flipped classroom scenario where the lecture really was all outside of class. They were still doing lecturing. Yeah, I think people did find it frustrating when it felt like there was lecture online that was required and lecture in class too because it was like I'm here like you have the same amount of time as everybody else why are you doing something that seems kind of less efficient mm -hmm. um, with that time but particularly I think one that I mentioned was different was the dynamics and control class so where that was yeah. yeah it was I think slightly uh, different it was different than any other instruction that I've received I don't know if it's totally like a flipped classroom model, um, but he didn't just go through and derive the equations right. and do a standard kind of lecture. And I think that um, he made it more of a dialogue between students and the instructor, and I think that was um, really something that people okay. responded to. Let's take time for any one question. Anybody have a question for Anna? Okay. So if we decide to integrate that into the MITx platform here, we'll have to somehow or another name it after you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the key with that is that um, the role of texting would be to uh, further a relationship between professor and student. Um, so not kind of, I know that if you've taught classes, you can kind of, you can post on Stellar and it sends an alert to everybody gets email on their phones. Um, but I think the difference would be that, you know, it's kind of like checking up. It's like a reminder to study and not like, oh, reminder, a piece that due on this day. It's kind of, uh, or at least that's the way I use it. And I know that's a lot easier to do with tutoring. Well, you emphasize personalized yeah. learning. So it's got to be personal, not an anonymous text. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So why don't we move on? John, sure. can you go next? These are pretty incredible people. I don't know if I can follow this. <coughs> we'll try. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, hi. Uh, my name's John. I'm kind of a nerd, uh, but I guess I'm in the right place for that. 
Uh, to quantify this and kind of explain to you how I'm a nerd, uh, I wear socks and sandals. Uh, but not just like on like a daily basis. On kind of a, like way more than that. Like, like, like high school dances, my dates would kind of get a little pissed. And like prom, my date kind of got a little upset. And then when I gave them a commencement speech in my high school, my class kind of got a little upset. But they all knew that like it was kind of neat. But the cool thing about being a nerd, and the awesome thing about being in this place, is it's OK. It's accepting. It's inclusive. It doesn't matter who you are, what you wear on your feet. You can engage. You can be involved. If you have that desire, if you have the will to learn. So that's kind of what I want to talk about. Uh, I come from Missouri, actually, Springfield, uh, which is hilarious. I have no clue of this. Uh, <laughs> and sure enough, as Anne said, uh, it's a decently small place. Uh, it's not like huge. It's like quaint. It's nice. It's got a lot of cool things. And similarly to the desires that Cody explained, I had a desire to do more, uh, to try to not just like live in Missouri and not just like live in like Springfield, although it's an awesome place. But I, I've talked to a lot of the leaders in my city, and they talk about an effect called the boomerang effect. The idea that you go off, you go to school, and then you come right back because that's where your home is and stuff. And that's awesome. But I think like a lot of you guys, I want to change the world. So I don't want that to be me. So early on, I knew I kind of wanted to do this. And I slowly started doing it, and I slowly went on. And then I discovered something, and it was really cool. My sophomore year of high school, I was bored with school. I tried selling candy as a side business to make some money. But after teachers got a little upset, I think they wanted some of the profits. Um, <laughs> after the teachers got a little upset, I tried something a little bit more engaging. So MITx launched their first course. I'll never forget it, 6002X, circuits and electronics. And I'm so excited. It was cool. Now, for those of you who don't know, 6002 is a class taken by generally second years at MIT majoring in computer sciences to teach you basic circuitry, everything from KVL to KCL to nodes, equations, voltages, and a bunch of stuff. So it's really fun. And I had no clue what I was doing. And it was really cool. I knew what a multimeter was. Uh, so I had that. But I had no clue anything else. So I studied a lot. Uh, I studied a lot. I remember every piece that was like Sunday night, so after I got home from like debate tournaments or whatever, I'd like go to my computer and like stay in my room all day. I'd be like, Mom, I don't want food now, I'll do it later. Uh, and it was really cool. And I remember when the final came around, because it was tennis season. And to study for it, I printed off every single exam of 6002 for the past years. And I took them to tennis matches, and I did it on the sidelines, and I'm like, all right, well, I gotta figure out what, what's the node voltage here, okay, well, what's the derivative of the current? Okay, well, uh. And it was really cool. And then I took the test. And then I took the final. And well, I come from the show me state. So I passed. <laughs> they posted some statistics afterward that I thought were really interesting. 157,783 students registered for the course. Of that, 5,900 and about 90 passed, got a passing grade in the class. I found that really interesting. The idea that so many started, kind of a few ended. So that's really what I want to talk about. Why does that 150,000 go to that small number of 6,000? I mean, even in my own instance, I tried to tell everyone in my class, like, guys, let's do this. It's going to be fun. And they carried it with me for like the first week. And then whenever I started talking about path integrals, they were like, this isn't for me. So I think that this can be approached in three different lights. I think it can be approached in an avenue of why. Why are we motivated to do digital learning, and what is it about? Second, what are the different ways in which digital learning we go about it, and what are different digital learning forms? And lastly, what's the future of digital learning? What's it going to look like in 2035, and different things? And to talk about each one, I want to talk about different anecdotes. So the first one, in terms of why. Now, I did MITx, but before this, I was actually doing other digital learning as well. And my first experience with this was with physics, which is now my major. And did you know that the universe is a four-dimensional Lorentzian manifold endowed with a global symmetric Riemannian metric of signature plus, minus, minus, minus? Yeah, don't worry. It doesn't actually mean anything anyways. Uh, it's just a bunch of general relativity stuff. But the fact is that I had to start somewhere. And so what I first discovered was OCW and the online lectures. And I remember every night reading like calculus books and like deciding, like, it's like a velocity. And then you take the acceleration. It was really cool. And so I learned that, and then through lectures of bowling balls and like different fire extinguisher skateboards and cars, it was really cool, it was really awesome. And then in high school, I wanted to try to continue this to try to further my understanding, but what I found is well, there are limitations in this world. 
So I didn't have a physics curriculum in my high school, and so I tried and I found in the back of a, in the back of one of my drawers one day, I found an invitation to the Stanford Online High School. The Stanford Online High School is a small school put together for full-time and part-time students in cohorts with Stanford University. And I took AP Physics C, which you actually need the prereq of AP Physics. So I like, studied in the car and did all that stuff. And then I passed and I got in. It was an awesome class. And the professor, his name's Dr. McHale. He's probably one of the coolest people. We talked about the personalization touch. And I think Anne did a really great job of emphasizing this idea that the connections you form are almost more important than the material. Uh, so for Dr. McHale, I, there's an exam. It's called the F equals MA. It's, it's the United States Physics Olympiad. Now, I'm terrible at physics. Like, seriously, I'm terrible at physics. But I tried really hard. Okay, that, that's what matters. Okay, I tried. Uh, and he stayed with us every day for like five, ten hours, working with us and like helping us. And that was really cool. And nowadays, every year, twice a year, I do a thing called a gravity tube with him. Now, quick lesson in physics. The world has gravity in it, believe it or not, and it comes from the central, it comes from mass. And the idea is that if you drill a tube through the world and you exclude differences in pressure and you assume a homogeneous body and you exclude air because we're physicists and you drop an item in there, it going back and forth will actually go at the exact same period of oscillation that you would if you were a satellite orbiting the Earth. It's really interesting. It's oscillatory motion, but it's really cool. So his idea was, why not show this to the students? So what he does is he goes in his office, and he shows the students a list of pictures. And he says, guys, I need to transmit a secret message out in California. And he says, guys, I need to transmit a secret message. Which message? And so he has the students vote. Now, he's a little trickery. Whenever staff send out polls on these most online classrooms, they're the only ones that actually see the answers. So he says, all right, guys, which picture? Then he sends a text to me which picture they choose. I package it into a little ping pong ball, go down in the tubes of MIT, and then pick it up out of a tube an hour later, 42 minutes to be exactly, and say, oh my gosh, it's cool. Physics works. And the cool thing is that interaction, this kind of silly idea of establishing this personalized connection is really what allows so many students to enjoy it. You know, it's awesome. Whenever you do this, it's not tutoring. I'm not nearly that much of a saint. I apologize. But it's really awesome because you're actually able to make a couple of people really happy, make them engaged. And I remember that because I remember like staying up late, like towards 11, 12 at night, falling asleep on my professor and he getting very upset. But I, I remember those random moments where I was like, wow, this is really cool. This is really amazing. Sanjay calls it the aha moment, as well as a not auger wall if you watch 6002 videos. And those are cool. And I think that's one of the most key fundamental reasons of why. We want that aha moment. We want that moment where we're like, wow, it's 42 minutes. That's something else, too. And we want those periods in time. So the second reason is, what, what exactly is digital learning? What are the different types of it? So I have another story about this. So it turns out, because I was a nerd, and because I did a lot of school and stuff, I didn't have a lot of time for video games. And if you know anything about the social sphere in high schools, it's that you've got to be really good at video games, or else it's bad, OK? <laughs> it's bad, OK? Like, read up on your World of Warcraft. So all my friends would play video games. And, and while, in the beginning, they played with me and stuff, but then I was kind of bad, because I didn't spend as much time on it as they did. So they stopped playing with me, and they stopped hanging out with me, which is really frustrating. Uh, believe it or not, losing your friends is rough. But that's OK, because I made a decision. I'm like, guys, you know what? Fine. I'm going to make a program that's going to beat you, and it's going to be a great program, and I'm going like, to solve general AI, and it's going to be awesome. The problem was I didn't know how to program at all. Uh, so, so I did research, and I did online. And I looked up the book. David J. Eek, Introduction to Java Program. It's about 776 pages. And I read like every single page of it. And I remember towards the end of it, when I was finishing up, we were on vacation in Cancun. And it was awesome. It was a great place. And due to discrepancies in kind of the billing idea, we paid for internet, but we didn't actually get it. So I was like, I got this, guys. Uh, so like, I sat in a closet, and I helped my family out. And then the IT guy from the hotel, he was a local Jamaican, or a local Cancun. And he came in, and he was talking. And he was like helping us out and like getting us set up and everything. And then he's like, yeah, I read that same book, too. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, that's how I learned how to do it. That's how I got involved in IT. And I think that's when it hit me. The digital learning isn't just one form. It's not MITx. It's not edX. It's not OCW. It's this collaborative effort that just knowledge is everywhere. And take advantage of it in whatever form it takes, whether it's a book, whether it's a class, whatever it is. That's what digital learning is, I think. So in terms of the 150,000 down to the 6,000 and whatnot, I think it's more about what they learn along the way. 
those aha moments that they realize. The different parts when they're like, wow, I can do something now. I can make some good in the world. I think that's what that's about. So the last thing is about the future of digital learning. And I think this is going to take a number of different aspects. Uh, I've given a number of like talks and presentations around campus about like what I think the future of digital learning is. And after the task force was instituted, Sanjay helped us out with a group of students who was specifically designed to try to figure out how do we integrate this digital learning into the campus. And we figured out a couple of different initiatives. So I'm just going to talk sci-fi with you guys for a little bit. Uh, okay, so first off, virtual reality is obviously a big thing and coming out. And so the idea of creating this communal workspace where maybe people don't even go to MIT, they just put on a goggles and then they interact with other people, that's a pretty crazy idea. And this is pretty insane. So the question is, is this effective? Well, OK, well, you need to analyze that. What do you lose? OK, you lose this personalized connection. This is a problem. This is a very real problem. Plus, you're kind of only selecting a very minority group of people, the people that can pay for this. But what do you gain, right? MIT accepts about 4,000 undergrads, about 1,000 undergrads a year. The number of people that were in that online class registered about 150,000. That's a scale MIT can't compete with on just logistical reasons alone. They have to turn away a lot of really brilliant people, and they make wrong choices like me. But, <laughs> but, but the fact is that you need some way to be able to reach those people, engage them, and help them. And I think that's what a lot of that virtual reality and a lot of these ideas are for. I think you'll always have institutes, and I think you'll always have great places with personalized connections that can really give you opportunities and ways to make the world a better place. But I think at the same time, you need a way to be able to reach people that are hanging out in South Jersey. And I mean, fair, right now, the affordability of it, like, obviously, is not something that's like fair. But I think in the future, we can work towards that. Another idea is one that actually a friend is very passionate about. So back when edX started, I don't know if you guys know this, they didn't have, like now they have like 600 courses, you can probably say this, way better than me. You guys have a lot. A thousand, a lot. And every week I get an email on my phone that's like, you have 10 new courses you should check out. And I'm like, whoa, that's cool. I want to learn algebraic topology. But it's not always been like that. In the beginning, it was just like a trickle. It was like one or two or three. And they were kind of very interesting courses, and they were very sparsed out. So I ended up taking random things from nanotechnology to future of human justice. And I learned a lot of cool things, like the majority of people in Africa live under a dollar a day. It makes you think about what you do with a dollar a day. Really interesting points. Or like how nanotechnology, how like hard drives on your computer are actually made. It's really fascinating. They actually deposit silicon. It's a long story. But anyways, the cool thing apart this is the idea that there's so much diversity that there's a lot of breadth that can be accessed. But the question is, as this breadth expands, as we as a culture find more knowledge, as Wikipedia grows more and more massive every day, as more YouTube videos get uploaded, how do we pick what to learn? And that's a really important question. How do you pick what to learn? How do you pick the things you're passionate about? How do you pick what you want to do? So that's kind of where the second idea of the sci-fi comes in. What if you had a way to kind of quantify this, slash a way to map this? There's an initiative at MIT called Crossroads. Crossroads. And the idea is that it tries to link different activities and different ideas together. If you want to learn differential equations, maybe the best way to learn that for you is by looking at 803 and coupled oscillators. Or maybe it's a different approach by looking at circuits and then looking at oscillatory nature of currents. So maybe linking these different topics and building some path for knowledge, finding some way to figure out what to learn next in a world where you can learn literally anything. And I think that's where another facet of online learning is really going. And I think that'll be really important in digital learning, is finding a way to actually do this and a way to really have that. So yeah, I'm a nerd. I keep wearing my sandals. But I think I've learned a lot. And I've gone from a student who really didn't know the difference between velocity and acceleration, although they were different dials on a car, to the fact that I can now kind of explain to you what a pseudo Ramanian metric is, even though no one really actually can. <laughs> But don't worry about it. And the fact is that online learning and digital learning has been able to do this. And it's been able to do this for a heck of a lot of people. And that's really cool. So let's do it together and let's change the world. Thank you. So John, I, I do have a question for you. Sure. What do you wear? on campus, walking around, in February when the snow's like this deep? Yeah, OK, so it's actually really interesting. OK, so the socks and sandals. 
So the problem with socks and sandals, interestingly, is, if, is, is not inside, right? Inside's fine. And if it's hard snow, it's fine. The problem is slush. The problem is water, right? Because if you get the socks dirty, this is a problem. I'm pretty sure I've hypothermia on these toes, but I'm not totally sure. So the trick that I've learned is you take off the socks. Because interestingly enough, you don't get hypothermia from just like wetness. There's a physics answer to this. Oh right, my right, god! Right. <laughs> so, so it's about pre-planning. So if you need to go outside for a long trip, like I live up Mass Ave, I take off my socks, I go down the street, I wash, I like like wipe them off that way they're dry, and then I put my socks back on, so it's comfortable. Oh. Seriously, you guys should try. Wow. <laughs> That's great. Okay, I'm, I, I think what we'll do so that we get through the presentations and have time uh, for some just general questions uh, before we have to go to coffee break. I want to ask Rachel to uh, finish it up with her story. Hi, so my name is Rachel. I'm from Houston, Texas. Um, I'm actually pretty involved in the education space here at MIT. I've been a TA now for three years, um, single variable calculus, and then also one of our design and manufacturing classes here for sophomores in mechanical engineering. Uh, I've also taught in Korea. I've led student groups there twice now during the summer to teach or during the winter to teach North Korean defectors. And I've also um, helped work with a high school summer program here to teach uh, get girls interested in engineering. Um, but I guess more importantly is to go back a little bit. Um, so my family's from Argentina. Um, so like education was like kind of important, but like not really in my household, and I didn't go to a great school. Uh, so the school I went to is actually that school where when all the teachers in other schools are like really bad, but they can't fire them because of like contract issues, they'd send them to my school. So that was always really, really interesting, um, really interesting experience for sure. Um, and then my school was actually all on free and reduced lunch um, and breakfast as well to give you a little bit of an idea of the background that I went to. Um, and so my junior year, I took AP Calculus. It was one of the three classes in AP that my school offered. Um, and after I took it, they actually got rid of it. And that's because every single one of us got a one on the AP exam, which if anybody doesn't know what the scale is, like one is you literally write your name and like <laughs> got nothing right. Um, which, you know, now I'm here, so that's always interesting. Um, but that really made me realize like how much I didn't know because at the school I had been to, I could do nothing and I could still be at the top of my class. And so that kind of was a bit of a wake up call and it's like, well, maybe in this context I'm doing great, but in the context of the world, there's so much more I could learn and that kind of, like spurred me, and so then a fluke from that, I ended up at MIT for a summer program um, in engineering, which was a life-changing experience, and I was introduced to OCW. And so that was kind of my first introduction to digital learning, um, and so from there, I took some classes on OCW just for fun when I felt like I wasn't really gaining anything um, at my high school. Um, and then once I came to MIT, I actually piloted uh, two MIT X courses. So the first one I did um, was 802, which is Introduction to Electricity and Magnetism. Um, I did that when I was a freshman, my freshman spring, and I was part of a learning community. Um, so we would take classes of 20 to 30 students versus 700 in a lecture hall. So we were like great guinea pigs to test out this like 802 class. Um, and it was actually very frustrating for us. Um, we'd have these homework assignments and we would have no idea what was going on because we'd type in our answers and it would just tell us we were wrong. And this was before it would start giving us hints or telling you why your answer is wrong. And so we would do something very similar. We'd pool our answers. And so we'd, none of us were ever allowed to type in answers because our class was only 20 people bid. So we all knew each other. And so we were not allowed to type in answers on our own. We'd always get together in the afternoons and we'd all sit there and we'd be like, I think this is the answer. And so we'd type it in and it would be wrong. And the next person would go and be like, okay, well, maybe it's this. And so we'd go all the way around in a circle of 20, typing in our answers. And it's not because we didn't do the work. I mean, we had done hours of piece setting. We had thought we had these great answers, and it'd be a weird minus sign. Or half the time, it wasn't even us, but because it was a piloted class, the answers were code encoded wrong. And so sometimes our answers would actually be right. But we didn't know that. Um, and so that was actually a really frustrating experience. But on the flip side of that, Having that instant feedback when we did get an answer right was great, because then we were like, oh, we actually know what's going on, which was really helpful because when I took um, this introduction to 
electricity magnetism class, we actually did a flipped classroom model. And so we were doing these online videos um, on our own time, doing reading questions online, and then also doing these online P sets, so online problem sets, and then we'd go into class and do more uh, problems with the instructor. Um, the only problem with this was by doing this flipped classroom model and having to watch these lecture videos on our own time, the length of the class doubled. So an MIT class is supposed to be 12 hours a week, and that's usually like three hours of lecture and like six hours of homework, plus or minus a couple hours for other things. Um, and we were doing, we had, I think we had counted it up, and we were doing 24 hours a week for this class, which while normal for thermodynamics, is not necessarily normal for a freshman introductory class. Um, and so that was something that we had really, really disliked and actually, in a way, had kind of put up these walls that like this class is like not fun, right? Um, and so we had, I guess in a way, adapted this like pattern of behavior because of the way you needed to like inset pro uh, like type in our answers, like figure out like how to get the right answer on these problems. And half of it was like gaming the system too, because you watch these lecture videos, and it was actually asking us questions not to gauge whether or not we were like understanding the material like a clicker question would in class, but it was they were actually asking us questions on like making sure we were watching the videos, which seems kind of counterintuitive since you're watching the videos on your own time, so you'd hope you'd be watching them. And, but then you couldn't answer the questions, so then you'd get points off, and then that was like part of my grade, and so then, it, then I disliked the class even more, and then just kind of went in a little bit of a spiral from there, but I think, uh, I, I guess, sort of from that, um, it'd be really easy to make the experience a lot better if, you know, things are asked really insightfully. So if I'm taking this class, and it really tries to, like, test my knowledge versus test how good I am at typing an answer into this little tiny box where I can't really see what's going on, or making sure it's asking me, like, legitimate questions for, like, testing my knowledge just to make sure I was like paying attention to the videos. Um, another thing I wasn't really a huge fan of were the demos. Um, and this isn't related to the introductory class um, in electricity magnetism, but I also took the same um, dynamics class that Anna took, but I took it a different semester. Um, and so we had the normal lectures uh, where they derived the equations, and we just did our homework online. And the sample, the homework, you know, I thought that went fine. Um, same problems as before. Um, we would type them in. Sometimes you'd be right. Sometimes you'd be wrong. Sometimes you'd be right, but the thing said you were wrong. Um, but was I think this is a class. It's called dynamics, right? And dynamics means like moving things. But we did not do a single demo in that class, right? And and, and that's crazy, right? We're at MIT, and this class has no demos for a class about things that move, right? And and if anyone's taken a dynam dynamics course, it's often really hard to visualize. Like, you've moved this one gear, and then, like, a gear over here, like, spent, like, four times faster, and you're like, how does that work? And it was really difficult, and I thought, like, because we had this online platform, that had been a great way to really show us, like, I, like GIFs, or GIFs, however you want to say it. Um, there's, like, great things online, so, nowadays, and so, one of my friends is taking this class now, and she asked me, you know, she was asking me for help on her homework, and it was like a crankshaft, and she was like, I don't, I don't understand how this works. And so I was trying to explain it to her, and eventually I gave up, and I just like Googled like crankshaft GIF, and like showed it to her, and she was like, oh, I get it. Like, right, it just like took like half a second of her staring at this little animation of it moving, right? And if they had included that in the course, like, she would have never even had these problems on her homework. And I think that's one of the biggest things that are missing from these online digital learning classes, and that's like, demos and ways to connect that to student learning. Um, and so that kind of spurred my undergraduate thesis, in a way, um, my experiences with these classes. So I was working on, this past year, creating low-cost experiments for online physics classes, introductory, introductory mechanics classes, to be specific. And so what we did is we created these suites of lab experiments that are no more than 75 cents each. And so not only can they now be paired with online physics classes, so students can go out and buy rubber bands and a ruler, because they don't need anything more complex than that, but now they can actually get demos in their own home. And so it's not just them watching something on a screen and kind of being like, oh, I see how that works, but like, uh, well, like whatever, right? It's on a TV screen. But they can actually do it on their own and like see, see like, oh, when I like the length of 
whatever for a pendulum, like does, it doesn't actually matter, or the mass at the bottom doesn't affect how fast like the period of a pendulum moves. And it's things like that. And so we've actually been testing this now. We've rolled it out um, into that same group that I did. I was a guinea pig with years ago. We now guinea pigged with them. Um, so that was an interesting little turn there. Um, but we've also been distributing this out to university professors all over the world to like work in their physics classes because not only is it great for online classes, but it's because it's so cheap. Now schools like the schools I went to where we couldn't afford actual like hands-on learning they can now do it too. But I, I think that's like really direct the direction that um, digital learning needs to go. It needs to kind of incorporate the things that we know work great in classrooms. Like nobody's gonna argue against you that like hands-on learning isn't important. And if they do argue against you about that, it's, like, it's kind of bad. Because everybody knows that it's, it's really good for student learning. And we also know that digital learning is great for opening up access to students all over the world. And so I think we're kind of at the stage where we've got both that are really good and we need to figure out how to merge them. Um, so yeah, I think the online space has come really far, far in the past few years, and I think there's a lot of room to grow, and I think that room to grow has a lot to do with hands-on learning, so thank you. Are these guys incredible, or what? I mean, wow. Um, one thing I just want to say, I'm really happy to hear you talk about what doesn't work, what hasn't worked, because I think it emphasizes we're in the middle of this experiment. I mean, we are just getting started with all this stuff. And unfortunately, it means that our students have to be guinea pigs. You use that phrase, Rachel. Uh, and so let me, before we turn to the audience for questions, how does it feel to be in the middle of that right now? I mean, like, you know, does it feel dis disruptive to you? Do you resent it? Um, you, you t you're doing things to fix it. I mean, that's probably ex pretty exciting. But just in general, do you guys have any questions or, or I mean, any comments about that? I would say that it feels a little frustrating sometimes to feel like it's a top-down directive. Um, I don't know that that's what it is, but Drawing from my mom's experience as an educator, whenever you know the administrator downtown gets this great idea that there's like, oh, there's this new thing and we have to do it and every single teacher has to do it and this is the way things are gonna be. Um, like that doesn't necessarily work for every single teacher and so it feels sometimes like, I don't know, I think a, a great way to move with it um, would be to make it really easy for teachers to do their own content um, like really, really easily because every one of these classes that I've taken, it's like an entire team of people that are trying to do this and make this one course that's supposed to stand and be used like year after year. And so like if a different professor teaches it the next semester, it's like the same lecture from a previous semester and it might be kind of different from how the current instructor wants to do it. And so I think making it more flexible so that it's like an easy tool for instructors to mold to whatever their style is, is really important. And I felt that, um, I felt that uh, taking these classes. Cody. Yeah, I'd say that it's a very like, just exciting time. Like I'm always thinking about the different possibilities of things that we could do. And I find kind of frustration that we're, we can't move fast enough to like build and try all these different things. Uh, Though at the same time, I mean, the current kind of, the current tools and kind of what we're doing right now, I do worry about kind of like this whole kind of achievement gap and like if we're just widening the achievement gap and how that's not just like a technology problem that we also need to kind of, it's a societal change and that there's more, we can have amazing tools, but we actually need to get people to use it. So I'll, it, it was actually kind of nice. One of my teachers at my high school came up with a good phrase that I always think about, which is um, motivate, inspire, and teach. That's kind of how he thinks about like education and his students and stuff like that. Conveniently, the acronym spells MIT, so it's easy for me to remember. But um, I kind of try to think about that too and like in mentoring students and trying to help out and stuff like that and trying to get people excited about education. Uh, yeah. So we've had Motivate, Inspire, Teach. We've had AHA. Who was it that talked about AHA? 
And then you guys weren't here earlier in the week, but we learned about the ah, aha, ha ha. So that that you know, these things all sort of come together. I think there's there's a paper to be written there. Okay, let's. Uh, we've got about ten minutes, and uh, let's open this whole thing up to to you. Um, we'll start on the right hand side. Yeah. Uh, my name is Tom Bellator. Um, that was awesome. I think the best thing in the conference so far. So good job, guys. As, as a parent of a 14, 11, and 9-year-old who don't seem to be very motivated, I want to hear from you guys. You know, the brains, they're obviously there. The opportunity to learn things from great people is also there. But that intrinsic motivation you have to go out and get it, where does that come from? And how do you foster it in others? Thank you. I watched a lot of PBS as a kid. This is a true question. I mean, like, you can read psychology studies that suggest that curiosity like, enhances learning and understanding by like, tenfolds and magnitudes. And in terms of like, finding causes for like, motivation in terms so many people have like been confronted with this question and tried to answer it. I think the best way in terms of my life at least, uh, it's a matter of finding a direction. Right? So, so for, for instance, like, like how I learned programming was literally because I wanted to make an AI to beat my friends. Because I really love video games. And like seriously, they're really fun. And so I think it's a matter of finding that in your daily life. Right? We talk about simple hacks. Uh, and there's like whole YouTube channels devoted to the idea of like doing really silly things that make your life a little better. I'm trying to think of one, but sorry. Uh, and so I think that starting there and figuring out kind of what your niche is is a really great way. In terms of specific cases, yeah, Rife talked about like the 1% who's lucky and he wants to give that opportunity to everyone. But I think unfortunately like where the conversation is going right now it's more towards the idea of like playing a probability game in terms of exposing as many people as possible and then banking on someone being able to find inspiration. In terms of specific cases, I would say taking your own like directive and initiative is like pretty good. But yeah, I'm sorry, this is like a really terrible answer. <laughs> Anybody else have something to add? Anna? I would maybe say my dad, my brother and my sister are in high school, or my sister's in college now, but my dad um, has asked me a lot. He's like, oh, you know, your brother is just like, he just like doesn't want to do all the things that you want it to do. I'm like, well, of course not. <laughs> um, but I think what um, when people kind of ask me this question, it's like, how are you intrinsically motivated? It's like, well, I don't know. I just like want to do these things. Um, but I think what it is when I look at everything that I've ever dedicated a lot of time to or um, cared about in any way, for me, as I've already talked about a lot, it's always come down to the relationships. Um, you know, she mentioned that. I was a swimmer, and the only reason I started doing that was because my like best friend from preschool was doing swimming, and I wanted to hang out with her. And then little did I know how far it would spiral from there. But I think that's that's for me what it is really about. And I've seen my brother recently has like become a little bit more dedicated. He started trap shooting, which if you don't know what that is, you like shoot clay pigeons with a shotgun. And his best friends in the whole world do that. And as a consequence, he wants to spend two hours every single day doing it. And so I think that's the important thing. OK, let's, um, let's move on to the next question. Paul. Great, thank you. Um, so first of all, I want to echo uh, uh, what you said. Uh, so to thank you all, because the authenticity of your, of your input and your collective stories is, is so important for us as educators and digital technologists. I mean, it's a wonderful, wonderful feedback. So thank you. Um, and I, I've heard a common theme coming out of all your messages, which I heard not quite as strongly um, in the earlier parts of the conference with the other presenters, and that is the, the, the importance of, of teaching with stories and of the human connection uh, and having to be, weave that through all the digital you know, learning that we do. I think it's critically important, and, I, and I, I'm just so happy that it came through loud and clear in your presentations. So I do have a specific question for Rachel. Um, uh, thank you, first of all, for the courage to share your, your experience so authentically and, and so eloquently. Um, my question is, um, you know, my colleagues and I have had a lot of debates about creating digital simulations um, in lieu of, uh, you know, classroom demos, as you call it. 
Um, and you, know, you can do this in, in a very neat and tidy way you, using HTML5 technologies. You can bundle in a single offline file you know, all your objects and you can have all these animations and you know, interactives, digital interactives. Um, but it's, it takes a lot of you know, human capital and time and energy to create those versus taking some rubber bands and, and having these little packages that, that you're talking about creating. I think that's great. Where do you, where do you see digital interactives or digital simulations um, fitting in and supporting you know, the actual physical packages? Do you see a place for that? And if so, like how might you personally want to use that? Yeah, I think there are things that definitely go hand in hand with each other. And so I, I think both are good and I think they're even better together. Um, and so like when I was watching these lecture videos, I think what would have been optimal would have been if they had done demos in class and then maybe I had done my own little small thing at home or if they had shown videos and animations of how these things worked in class and then I had done you know, something else with like my hands. And so I think there's a really great space for those to work into the lecture videos or the reading questions and all these things you have kids do in the online space and then I think you can then take from that and then when you're having them do something hands-on, you can refer back to that and so the kid knows exactly where this is coming from and it's not just like some random project you're having them do but they can very easily see how this connects to what they saw in lecture. And so I think there's things that go very well together. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. So our friend from Russia. From Russia, from Siberia. Yes. Uh, one very brief question. Uh, first of all, of course, thank you very much for sharing your stories. Amazing stories, and you, you did really well in front, so, uh, in front of so, so many teachers, you know. It's not easy sometimes. But my question is not about teachers, it's about your peers, about students uh, all over the world, you know. If you could send a message to your peers in Ghana, in Siberia, in Mongolia, uh, in this global digital world uh, with this changing approach to education, uh, what could you tell to your peers in one phrase, one, one piece of advice, how to be so successful like you, you are at MIT, you know. Uh, just could you please form, formulate uh, just in one sentence maybe. One sentence. Just one sentence. A, pi a piece of advice to your peers, yeah, <laughs> globally. Wow. <laughs> That's a tricky question, I know. Yeah. Can we have like two, three? Or... Okay, John, you can have two. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'll copy one from my granddad, uh, just because I can't think of like anything great right now, so apologies. My granddad once told me that digital learning is really great for people who care more about learning than just getting a piece of paper. And I think that's the most important thing to keep in mind. Because I think more in the world of the world is shifting towards the idea and recognizing the fact that if you have the skills to do something, if you have the skills to do a job, you can do the job. It doesn't matter your background. And I think that's a really empowering idea. So, sorry, that's kind of more than one sentence. That's not bad. I'm sorry. I don't do English. Thank okay, you. I do, but never mind. Cody, you have a sentence coming. I can tell. It's just, it's there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's just so many thoughts, like so many different things that, like, I would have a conversation and we could just talk about it. Um, but I've just been amazed by just the power of education and how it can transform your life and just enable you to achieve more than you ever imagined. Like, coming into MIT, I, I remember, and just the fact that with hard work and determination you can get there, that you can overcome anything. I remember when I first was, came to MIT, uh, my, I actually, my boss, I worked at the library across the street from my high school. Her parents drove me up here um, because my grandmother was too old to drive. So I was just there by myself, lying in my bed, just thinking to myself, like, wow, I'm here. Did I make a mistake? I was, like, almost having a nightmare. I'm like, I'm competing up against so many amazing people that are doing, like, so motivated, that had so many, ba like, awesome backgrounds, went to amazing private schools, like, that are just reading physics textbooks for fun. Like, one of my, fr like, one of my <laughs> friends, he already just took every course imagined. I was like, wow, I can't, I can't, I, like, how am I going to compete with these people? But, and, like, how, like, is this, is this the right place for me to be? And I just was amazed by 
like how much I was able to do, but also the resources and how willing everyone was to help. Like, I, I'm a person that took full advantage of office hours. I went there, I talked to the TAs, I worked with like professors, I had amazing advisors like Sanjay and Ike that really just transformed me and like got me to a higher level. So I would just try to get that sentiment across to them that through education, you'll meet so many amazing people that will elevate you to another level. Okay. Yeah. Well, with that, let's give these guys a round. Each of them, Anna, Rachel, Cody, John. Thank you so much. <laughs>